Hello, welcome to the Apostolic Church of Enfield for Sunday morning, September 6th, 2020. We are continuing in the eighth lesson, the eight steps from death to life, the eighth lesson of the Foundations of Life Bible Study Series. <clears throat> and it is the final of the eight lessons in the Foundations of Life series, but this is session number 30 of the eight steps from death to life. <clears throat> what we're going to be doing is continuing the subject we started last week, the crisis points in the eight steps from death to life. And we're going to go into the concept of it again a little further than we did before. I thank you for joining me for this session and ask if you would bow your heads for a request unto the Lord. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for giving us an understanding of your ways, Lord. We appreciate knowing more than just what you do, but knowing why you do them and how you do them. Not talking about the mechanics of it, Lord, but the purpose and the process. We thank you for your instruction today, and I ask you to bless this audience in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. And uh, you may be seated. <clears throat> I'm going to begin by sharing with you the purposes for crisis points. The purposes. Crisis points do not reveal anything to the Lord, but they are for your edification. The Lord, of course, knows everything already, but you have need of learning and being built up. Crisis points in the eight steps from death to life are designed to reveal to you areas of your own life that you have not yet submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Crisis points Reveal the areas of your life which will cause you greater problems down the road if you don't get them fixed. And remember that God uses temptation, which crisis points are, to build spiritual power into his people. Tribulation worketh patience and so on. Crisis points are not opportunities for failure. They are opportunities to succeed. Crisis points are, in fact, God-given opportunities for you to repent. <clears throat> Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. The sorrow of the world worketh death. And God-given opportunities to repent come during crisis points. Crisis points give you new opportunities to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and receive power to overcome. Crisis points present you opportunities to strengthen your godly life by denying yourself and submitting to the principles of living that have been established by God. Crisis points are not to be feared. Somewhere along the way, you are going to be reminded that you're not yet perfect. You're going to be reminded that you still need a whole lot of Holy Ghost help and you still need a pastor, and you still need the fellowship of the saints to help you on your way. Your wrong response in the crisis can produce very negative effects in your life. Understand that the Lord Jesus Christ intends nothing but good for you but yourself can make a tragic mess out of a great opportunity. 
And we need to look at temptations and crises, crisis points differently if we're going to survive them. We're not going to look at them as opportunities to fail. Remember that God uses temptation to build spiritual power into his people. If you know where the crisis points are in the road, and you choose to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ, you are ultimately going to arrive at the glorious destination. But if you choose to do your own thing, you're going to be grabbing on to the cursing side of God's sword. There is a blessing side and a cursing side. And each time he speaks, you get a choice to grasp one side or the other. Say praise the Lord if you would. So don't do your own thing. Now, each crisis point has its purpose. Every crisis point has its purpose. And I want to talk to you about those purposes for crisis points. In... Lesson four of the Foundations of Life Bible Study series, Repentance. I spent a lot of time teaching you what the Lord taught me about this whole process of crisis points and repentance. I am not going to repeat very much of that lesson. Just a few reminders and some additional comments. One of the astonishing discoveries we made in that study on repentance is that you do not get to choose when you can repent. Jeremiah 18.1 is where it is detailed so precisely. Please follow along with me. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. I, I can't go past this without a comment. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and said to him, uh, Go down to the potter's house. That's where I'm going to cause you to hear my words. <laughs> what the Lord is saying is, this is more than just a common communication between you and me. I'm going to have you hear something. I'm going to have you hear my words that are going to reveal a great, great truth to you. So then I went down to the potter's house and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. What would you expect? And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel. This seemed good to the potter to make it. He didn't throw it out. He made it something else that seemed good to him. <clears throat> then Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, Cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. <clears throat> the next thing he says is the critical component. What has he said so far? I can make you again a new vessel to what, to what I want it to be. Even though you've been marred, I can take care of that. You're in my hand like the clay's in the potter hand. But here, the next thing. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck it up and to pull down and to destroy it if that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil 
I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. Do you hear the word of the Lord? He told Jeremiah to tell his people when they have an opportunity to repent. Now, therefore, verse 11, now, therefore, he says to Jeremiah, go to speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, thus saith the Lord, behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. Return ye <clears throat> next Thursday afternoon or after you've taken time to think about it and give a good consideration. No, return ye now every one from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. You see, opportunities to repent do not come when you decide it's time for a change. They come when God speaks through his preacher. <coughs> Excuse me. And you discover through the preaching that it's time for a change. At what instant I shall speak. It's not during the week I spoke or in the month after I speak. It's at what instant I shall speak. Hebrews 4 and 12 tells us that the word of God is quick living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. <clears throat> Please think about this. Jeremiah also told us in chapter 9, I think verse 23, that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And he asked the question, who can know it? The word of God can know it and does know it. The Lord Jesus Christ knows your heart. You only think you know your heart, but it is more deceitful than any deceiver you've ever encountered in your life. And you cannot know your own heart, but the word of God does. It's sharp enough to discern the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So God sent Jonah and he sent Jonah to deliver the Lord's word of terrible judgment to Nineveh. Jonah 1.1. 1, 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. <clears throat> Chapter 3 and verse 1 says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Hey, folks, it's a good idea not to preach what he didn't bid you to preach. You're his messenger, not your own. So Jonah arose 
and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. And you know the whole story of how that process worked. And in verse 4, it says, And Jonah, chapter 3, verse 4, And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried. That doesn't mean wept. It means he called out. He yelled out loud. He cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Jonah came to Nineveh and delivered the totally negative word of the Lord concerning their coming destruction. There were no ifs, ands, ors, or maybes. Yet forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. It's going to happen. This was a crisis point for Nineveh. It was an opportunity for the Ninevites to repent. That opportunity came when God spoke through his prophet Jonah that he was going to destroy Nineveh. What would you do if you were a Ninevite and you heard that judgment message. What did the king of Nineveh and the Ninevites actually do? Jonah 3, 5 says, So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and set in ashes. The four things he did. You know, when the word of the Lord comes to you and it's bad news, get up off the throne. Get up off your throne. Let the Lord be the Lord. Let him be God and sit on the throne. He laid aside his robe. Get rid of your royal garments. Get rid of your kingly authority uh, symbols. And cover yourself with sackcloth. That's the lowliest, most menial uh, of all garments and a symbol of humiliation and sit down in ashes giving a sign that you are done for that's what the king of nineveh did and he caused it to be proclaimed and published through nineveh by the decrees of the king and of his nobles saying let neither man nor beast herd nor flock taste anything let them not feed nor drink water but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto god yea let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands who can tell the king is asking who can tell if god will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not who can tell god's word tells us the answer and god saw their works that they turned from their evil way and god repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them and he did it not you do not have unlimited opportunities to repent. You don't just get to decide, well, today I'm going to repent. You don't have that ability. Repentance is a gift from God, and He decides when you have the opportunity. So the opportunity comes, as the Lord said, at what instant I speak.
1 Corinthians 1 21 concurs with this because it says, for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So let me remind you, crisis points do not reveal anything to the Lord about you or anything else. He already knows. But they are intended to edify you and bring blessing to you. Crisis points in the eight steps from death to life, the eight principles of God and that he orders you to live your life by, they are designed to reveal to you areas of your life that you have not yet submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And you've already learned that when you gave Jesus all, you had no idea how much was involved. Crisis points reveal the areas of your life which will cause greater problems down the road if you don't fix them when they're brought to your attention. Remember, God uses temptation to build spiritual power into his people. He doesn't tempt you with evil. He tempts you, and in the temptation, he gives you a way of escape, obedience to him, where he makes the change in your heart and empowers you to overcome the problems. Crisis points are not opportunities for failure like the devil would like you to believe and like preachers have always told you. They are not opportunities for failure. You need to understand that problem, that crisis, that temptation is an opportunity to succeed. Crisis points are God-given opportunities for you to repent. Crisis points give you new opportunities to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and receive power to overcome. Crisis points present you opportunities to strengthen your godly life by denying yourself and submitting to the principles of living the eight steps from death to life that have been established by God. Now, crisis points are used as a means of culling the crowd. And I want to talk to you about that. It's very important. The Lord uses crisis points to call the crowd to minimize the multitude. Calling the crowd separates some from the others. It removes some from the whole. His methods, the Lord Jesus' methods, often were opposite of what we think would be best. Jesus refused publicity and human promotion time and time again. Just the opposite of what we do. The Lord Jesus chose Peter, James, and John from among the twelve and took them up onto the mountain. Uh, can anybody say favoritism? Matthew 17 tells us about it from verse 1. And after six days, Jesus take Peter, taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, John's, James's brother, 
and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, apart from who? Everybody, including the other nine disciples. And was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and be not afraid. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be raised again from the dead. I'm sorry. There on the mountain, those three of his 12 chosen disciples got a vision of the other side. They got a picture of the God-man, the man who was God incarnate. They got a glimpse of him for a moment and saw that he stood not only in the realm of flesh and blood, but he also at the same time stood in the realm of the heavenly. They saw his countenance change and his raiment become brightened, whiter than could be whitened by all of the fullers of the earth and the clothes cleaners and all of the dyers of clothing. They saw a glory, this bright cloud, and they saw Moses, the patriarch of all the Old Testament, who was dead, the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. And they saw also Elijah, the mighty man of power, the great powerful prophet of God, who, by the way, was also not living on the earth. <clears throat> there they were, subservient to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you will, subservient unto the Lord Jesus Christ, and they figured this is a great thing for us. And he said, I'm paraphrasing. Now look, guys, don't tell anybody. As they started back down off the mountain, he said, tell the vision to no man. They had just heard the voice say, this is my beloved son, hear him. Don't listen to Moses anymore or to Elijah anymore. Hear this one, my beloved son. He said, don't tell. Keep this a secret. It's just between us. This refusal of publicity is difficult for most of us to understand. There was time that the crowd came to make him a king. What did he do? Ride the popularity wave? No, he refused. 
It's in John 16, 14, and 15. He turned them down. We know that the Lord Jesus Christ was not interested in having human promotion. Listen to it. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. I was puzzled by the obvious fact that Jesus was not looking for nor accepting human exaltation. And there was something more to it that I did not understand. I was also puzzled by the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ spent all night praying before he chose those 12 men to be his apostles. What would God incarnate need to spend time praying for to figure out who to choose? I was also puzzled by the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ late in his earthly life would say, have not I chosen 12 and one of you is a devil? Don't you think I know who I have chosen? There was some calculation that went into the choosing. In the latter day of his life, he said, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. He repeated that to them a couple of times. And you can find that in John chapter 15. He did that with thought. It wasn't just a spur of the moment idea. He had thought about what he was going to do. <clears throat> I've been puzzled by many things in the life of Jesus Christ. He's the one who's come to usher in a kingdom. You know, you need territory if you're going to have a kingdom. But more than that, a barren desert is not much of a kingdom. No matter how vast that barren desert is, without people, it's not much of a kingdom. Jesus came to institute a kingdom. You would think that his goal would be to gather a crowd. We are trying to build the church. Isn't the idea to get as many people as we can? Isn't every individual a soul that counts for something? Don't we measure our success by the numbers of people we get baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost and coming to our church? I was puzzled by Jesus. Yes, we do those things. It all seems true, and it makes it all the more puzzling that every time Jesus of Nazareth got a crowd, he said something or he did something to minimize that multitude. Every time a multitude would gather and follow him, he would do something or say something that would cause many of them to leave. Does that seem like the way to build a kingdom? Is the church ever going to be known worldwide if we don't get large numbers of people? Shouldn't we make it easy for folks to come in? <clears throat> I do not say. Hear me, I am not saying we need to compromise. But when somebody comes in, do we need to scare them away? Do we need to offend them? No, give them a chance. 
That's what we think. The Lord Jesus had a different idea. He deliberately did the opposite of what men think is the best way to build the church. <clears throat> Pardon me. The Lord Jesus Christ made following him more challenging than any other leader ever in history would. He was always saying and doing thing which, things which caused people to turn away. Now, I understand that people were offended not because of what the Lord Jesus Christ said and did, but because of the sin exposed in them by his own righteousness in word and deed. But regardless, many, even most people were offended and abandoned him. Mark 6, 1 is so powerful. Mark 6, the whole thing. And he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, oh, you should look up that word astonished. From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother, and the word means kinsman, of James and of Joses and of Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters, and the word means kinswomen, here with us? And they were offended at him. <clears throat> but Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round about the villages teaching. <clears throat> Did you notice the people spoke of even such mighty works are wrought by his hands. But did you also notice that the author of God's word did not think that healing the sick really qualified as mighty works? He could do no mighty works. Say he healed a few people. Why do we still consider healing the sick to be mighty works. Did you notice that the reason he did no mighty works there was because of their unbelief? It wasn't that he didn't have the power to do it. It was because of their unbelief that he didn't do it. They failed to pass this crisis point. Are we doing any better? Let's take a moment and look closely at what I think is the most amazing word in this incident. It's in Mark 6, 3. And they were offended at him. The word offended is translated from the Greek word skandalizo. You recognize that word, scandal. And the word means 
please, you've got to look past strong concordance. Get yourself into Thayer's lexicon and Lou and Nida and, and others, a lot of them, and find out that this word comes down in summary to, to be affected by a stumbling block. Either a stumbling block of your own imagination or a real stumbling block. Offended means to be affected by a stumbling block. Listen to scripture. Isaiah 8.3. Some of you have already thought of this. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear and let him be your dread and he shall be for a sanctuary but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and snared and be taken. The Lord of hosts is our sanctuary. But for some, he's a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. First Peter 1.25 repeats it, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Wherefore, or because of that, laying aside all malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up and spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore, or that's why also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises, the aretative virtues, the reasons he's praiseworthy, the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Do you notice that these scriptures identify the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lord of hosts? Yeah. Isaiah 28, 16 also speaks about this. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. 
he that believeth shall not make haste. That means he won't be in a hurry to escape problems. Romans 9.33 also says it. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Do you notice that these scriptures identify the Lord Jesus Christ as the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense? And they were offended. They were affected by the stumbling block. Many people shall stumble, fall, be broken, snared, and taken when they come to the crisis point of encountering him for who he is. For the selfishness of many people will motivate them to decide that the cost of following him is too high, even after they have received so much truth from him and benefited from his miracles. Listen to Isaiah 28, 9 to get a perspective. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. Line upon line. Here a little and there a little. <clears throat> For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people to whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. There is nothing good about going, falling backward, and being broken and snared and taken. Such people are being called from the crowd that was following him. We will learn more about this particular crisis point later in the lesson when we examine it in greater detail. Just a few more minutes. I was taught and trained that we are supposed to gather a crowd, and the larger the crowd, the better. I was taught and trained that we had a greater chance of victory if our army outnumbered the enemy. But I noticed that every time the Lord garnered a larger crowd, he said or did something that resulted in many of them turning away from him. I was always confused by this behavior of the Lord Jesus Christ. He often did things and said things that caused people to abandon him. There are other examples of Jesus doing or saying something uncomfortably shocking. And one of them happened during what is commonly called the Last Supper. You read about it in John 13, 24. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then, lying on Jesus' breath, saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop 
Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. The Lord's following words would have been heard as being demeaning, equating the remaining disciples to the unbelieving Jews. John 13, 33. Little children. Hey, wait. I'm one of your called disciples. I'm going to be apostle. Little children. Yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you. Well, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? You know, well, where are you going? We can't go. Jesus answered him, whither I go, thou canst not follow now, but thou shalt follow me afterward. Peter's question was more an objection than an inquiry, and the Lord Jesus' answer repeated what the disciples would have thought to be a denigration. You can't do it. You can't follow me now. But he also gave them a little hope that he did not give to those unbelieving Jews. But thou shalt follow me afterwards. Those encouraging words did not lessen the offense that Peter took at the Lord's denigration. Once you've been insulted, you may not hear the compliment that follows it. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. How do you feel when someone challenges your commitment, contradicts your own testimony, and closes the subject with the statement of your coming failure? We will learn more about this crisis point later in the lesson when we examine it in greater detail. One more illustration. Jesus offended his own family. You find it in Luke 8, and Mark 3, and Matthew 12. I'm just going to read from Luke 8, verse 19. Then came to him his mother and his brethren, and could not come at him for the press, a multitude, a crowd. And it was told him by certain which said, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to see thee. And he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. The multitude came to him and were pressing close about him. His mother and kinsmen arrived a little late, even though they desired to see him. The crowd prevented them from getting close enough, but they were important people, his relatives. So someone managed to get word to him that they were outside wanting to get in. Did he do what any reasonable leader would do? Did he acknowledge their importance and make room for them? No. They depended on their stature as his relatives to give them privileges. He gave them no privileges. They met a crisis point. Jesus affected people by clearly stating what it takes to be his disciple. And we will find out about that, Lord willing, next week. Thank you for your attention. Please 
bow your heads with me. Lord Jesus, we're thankful for your activity in our lives, even when it's proven to us that you've spoken once, twice, and we did not perceive it. But thank you, Lord, for the things you've brought into our lives and for bringing us through them, bringing them over them, giving us empowerment from our submission to you in them. We ask your blessing tonight, Lord, for this morning, Lord, on the people that hear this message. Help us to understand crisis points and help us to understand the purpose of culling the crowd. Why you minimize the multitude. We'll give you praise and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and God bless you. I hope to be preaching to you tonight.